What's up everybody? It's me, Black Omori, back at it again with another shader tutorial. This time I'm going to show you some cool, quick ways to add lighting to your 3D models with a very small amount of code. So to start off, I've got this little doodad that I've modeled up. This is currently being rendered with remarching. However, for this tutorial, how you render your object isn't too important. What's important is that your shader has access to the normal vector in global coordinates, and that's what we're visualizing right here. So the first thing we're going to do code-wise is uh, at the very end of the shader, uh, we're going to pass the output color through the square root function. So we're going to say frag color is equal to the square root of frag color. So the reason why we would do this is this is a color space conversion. So all of our lighting formulas that we're going to be using assume a linear color space. However, the output of a shader is going to be the sRGB color space. So in order to convert between the two color spaces, we need to do a transfer function, which is approximated by the square root. And if you don't do this, your lighting is going to look a lot darker than it should be. And doing this transfer function is just good practice in general. Uh, so the first lighting model we're going to implement is the fog lighting model. Uh, we're only going to do the diffuse component. And this simulates a light from infinitely far away casting onto the object. So this is going to be a directional light. So the first thing we have to do is define the direction the light is. So we're going to say light is equal to, and this has to be a normalized vector. And we're going to just pick this vector where it's coming from, the x, y, and z coordinates equally. Um, and this direction is actually the direction you'd have to look to see the light, and not the direction the photons are traveling. So it's actually the opposite direction that the photons are traveling. And then to get the actual brightness of the object, of the surface of the object from this light, we take uh, a float of brightness. So we're finding a new value. I cannot spell. Is equal to the dot product of the light value and the normal value. And so we have to output this value to the screen. So we're going to replace our normal value here when we define the out color with just the brightness value. Uh, so this looks pretty good. However, there's a bit of an issue. If we wanted to add multiple more lights, if we wanted to add them up, uh, you would see problems because uh, the light is actually ranging from 1 to negative 1 because the dot product will go from 1 to negative 1. And however, light, there's no such thing as negative light, so we have to take the maximum of the output of the dot product and 0. So any value below 0 becomes 0. Uh, and we run that, we don't see anything different, but if we added up more lights, it, would, it will add up correctly. So this looks pretty cool. Uh, however, half of our object is in shadow. Um, you might like the way this looks. In fact, there's an entire artistic tradition around playing with these sort of harsh shadows called caroscuro. However, for the purpose of this tutorial, where we want to visualize the shape of our object, the geometry of our object using the, um, using the way light casts on it, we might want to uh, get more detail about the dark area. So one thing you might try to do is implement the ambient component of the Fong model. So this is the diffuse component. Uh, the ambient component uh, simulates light coming from all directions equally. And that is just a constant value which is added to the brightness. So if I add a constant value of 0.1 to the brightness and run it, we see that those dark values have been pulled up um, to be brighter. Um, however, I would urge you to basically never do this under any circumstance unless you're trying to emulate the look of old computer graphics, uh, largely because the ambient component is very unnatural, and I'll explain why. Firstly, in nature, you would pretty much never see light coming from all directions equally. That's not really something that happens with light. Um, this is because light almost always has some amount of directional variation to it, and the only way you would pretty much ever see uh, equal, equal light coming from all directions is if somebody built some lighting setup to, to actually do that. Uh, secondly, um, for pretty much any object, there's going to be some amount of self-occlusion. And so if I pause here, even though um, we're trying to model this ambient light coming from all directions, uh, it doesn't quite work because um, right under here, where we got the ring touching the X, um, right under there you would expect to see it darker because um, that area would be shadowed by the ring. The ring would shadow the ambient light coming from all directions. And this is the purpose of uh, ambient occlusion. If you've heard that term before, it's supposed to model the object occluding itself from this ambient light coming from all directions. However, because we're using the normal value, we can't actually simulate that. Uh, if we only have the normal value, we can't know anything else about the geometry. Finally, uh, using the ambient light doesn't actually solve our original problem, which is that we wanted to visualize these dark areas better. Because even though we've brought the light up, um, we haven't actually added any more information to the, the dark part of the object. We've add, just added a constant value to it. 
What I would argue is that this actually makes the object less readable because our eyes can understand a completely black shadow, but it can't quite understand uh, areas of, of pure gray. And it would actually interpret this area as completely flat when what we wanted to do was get the geometry information. So how might we uh, do something better than just adding a constant factor? So one thing we can do is instead of taking the maximum of the dot product in zero, um, where we cut off any values below zero, maybe we can map the output so that it goes from zero to one. So in order to do this, we need to map negative one to zero and one to one. So to do that, we multiply by 0.5 to map it from negative 0.5 to 0.5, and then we add 0.5 to map it from 0 to, to 1. So when we run this, what we get is some lighting, which is a little bit more comparable to a infinitely large area light. So pretty much any part of the object can see a little bit of the area light, and the brightness changes as it, as it moves away from the area light. So this looks pretty cool. However, you might think, well, the dark areas are now way too bright for my tastes. Uh, how could we get the best of both worlds? So one thing we could do is take a mix between what we originally had, which was the diffuse component with the very harsh dark shadows, and this new thing we've just done, which is more comparable to an area light. What we could do is we could take the mix between the two. So what we do is we just get the, um, the dot product, and then we just take the mix of um, the dot product maximized with zero. So that's the original Fong component. And then our version where we map it from 0 to 1. And this mix value will mix between this value and this value. So here we're taking 80% of this and 20% of this and just adding them up. And when I run this, we get some lighting, which looks pretty interesting. We've got um, a harsh, a harsh um, terminator line where it goes darker. But the um, dark areas are not completely black. Uh, in fact, I might actually want to make them a little bit darker. And so we can still see some detail in the dark areas. This lighting would might be a little bit more comparable to uh, the, the lighting hitting other objects in the scene and bouncing off and hitting the object from behind. So this is like bounce lighting. So those are some ways you can add detail to the dark areas of a single light. However, one other way you could do it is just by adding more lights. So let's add more lights. So let's remove this and bring us back to what we originally had. So we take the maximum of this in zero. And to make this easier, we're going to do a bit of refactoring where we just put the, uh, the light direction directly into our dot product here. And I'm just going to just change the ordering just a little bit. So here we're doing the same thing. We're just dotting the normal value with our, our light direction. And that should look the same. Next, what we can do is set brightness to zero and just add each light to brightness in turn. So we're going to say brightness is plus equal to this light. Then we add another light and another light. So we're going to have three lights. And if I run this, uh, it's going to look really bright. And that's because all the lights are coming from the same direction. So we have to define uh, different directions for each light. So uh, the first light will be our original light going from 1, 1, 1. Uh, and then the next two lights, say, will be 3 and then negative 3. So if I run this, um, I've got lights coming from different directions. That looks pretty cool. However, it's a bit blown out, so let's reduce the brightness of each light. So we do that by multiplying each light, let's say, by 4, 0.4. So this is a, a good general way to add multiple different lights, is you just add, um, you just add them together from different directions. However, uh, for the purpose of this tutorial, we want to find uh, small ways to quickly add lights. So um, what I'm going to show you is there are uh, three specific directions you could use that allow you to simplify the code by a lot. So uh, these directions are the first light is along the x direction, the second light is along the y direction, and the third light is along the z direction. So if I run this, we've got lights coming from different directions, uh, one along the x, one along the y, one along the z direction. And we can use a property of the dot product to simplify this code substantially. First of all, these vectors are already normalized, so we can just remove the normalize call from each one and simplify the code that way. Uh, next, I'm going to show you what the dot product actually does. So if we take the dot product of two vectors a and b, this is equal to uh, a dot x times b dot x plus a dot y times b dot y plus a dot z times b dot z. So for these specific vectors, um, this is actually equivalent to just taking um, n dot x, so this is equivalent to n dot x, 
uh, this is equivalent to n dot y, and this is equivalent to n dot z. And if I run this, it's the same thing. So we can simplify this even further now by exploiting the way that GLSL is designed. And that is pretty much any built-in function that takes in a scalar can usually always take in a vector as well, and it just performs that action on every single component individually. So here what we could do is we can say a max of n and 0, and that just takes the maximum of each component individually with 0. And then we just take x of this, and this is the same. So if I did that for each one, we haven't actually simplified it anymore. However, we can now take the dot product. We can use the dot product to simplify it completely. So what we're doing here is we're adding up individual components of the vector multiplied by some value. And up here, we've got the dot product defined, where we're doing the same thing here. So we could just turn this into a dot product. So if I delete all this stuff and delete this, we can just say this is the dot product of this and this. And that's equivalent to what we had before. And if I run this, we get the same thing. So now that huge amount of code we just had is simplified to just this single line. So that's awesome. However, uh, the placement of the light is a little bit weird. So it's pretty unnatural to have lights that are um, exactly axis aligned. So we have a, a light coming down directly from the z-axis, a light directly from the x-axis, and a light directly from the y-axis. So how would we reposition these lights to be a little bit more, more natural? Maybe we can rotate the lights. We can rotate everything so that the lights are a little bit more naturally positioned. So to explain this, I'm going to jump into Blender. So in Blender, I've mocked up the uh, assembly of lights that we have, where we have a, uh, a light for every single axis. And I've also put in a little sphere here, which represents the median point or the middle point between each of these lights. So these lights are actually infinitely far away, but these represent the directions where they're pointing along each axis. And the question is, can we rotate this so that it is a little bit more naturally positioned? So one thing we could do is we can rotate the whole thing so that the midpoint is now on the z-axis. And to do that, um, we have to rotate it along this uh, vector here. So I've got a rotation vector defined. And if I rotate um, everything around this vector so that the midpoint goes to the, um, the z-axis, so now the, the midpoint between the lights is now on the z-axis, now these lights are a lot more naturally positioned because they're more like studio lights pointing down at the origin. So how do we actually do this rotation in GLSL, in Shader Toy? So in order to do this rotation, I've got a function to find up here called erot. And erot allows us to rotate the point P around the axis AX by RO radians. And there's a link in the description that explains exactly how this function works. So you can copy and paste it and use it in your own projects. So what we're going to do is we're going to rotate the normal value. So we're going to say n is equal to erot of the normal value. And our axis of rotation is going to be negative one, one, zero. So these are sort of like a magic axis that we've, that we've found. And then the, the rotation value, the, the radians that we need to rotate is approximately 0.96. So um, this is also called the magic angle. Uh, and you can find this on Wikipedia. It's kind of interesting to learn about. But um, this angle comes up in a lot of different use cases. So when I run this, um, now our, our lights, our axis lights have been rotated. So they look a lot more like studio lights pointing down at the object. So now this looks a lot more natural than what we originally had for the axis lights. OK, so this is about it for the Fong model. Uh, now we're going to switch gears a little bit and explore image-based lighting. So image-based lighting allows us to apply the lighting from a panorama image, a 360 degree image, to a object. So to begin, we're going to pick a panorama. So Shader Toy has these cube maps which are basically 360 degree images of various locations. So we've got Forest, Ufuzi Gallery, and St. Peter's Basilica. So we're going to use Forest for this example. And in order to sample this texture, what we do is we just take, so I'm going to define a new float value called texture, or maybe image, because texture is a reserved word. And we're going to sample the texture called I channel 0 using the normal value. So this texture takes in a three-dimensional normalized coordinate and then returns the color of the panorama at that location. 
And because this is a float, we need to take in just the, say, the, the R value, the, the red value. And we're just going to set our brightness to be the image in our root, the dot value here. So when I run this, um, this looks pretty weird. And that's because we're missing a few things. First of all, everything seems to be rotated um, horizontally. And that's because uh, these images assume that the Y coordinate is the up coordinate. However, my scene uses the Z coordinate as the up coordinate. So we just have to do a swizzle operator where we reorder the coordinates. So we're going to make the Y coordinate now be the Z coordinate and the Z coordinate now be the Y coordinate. So when I run this, now everything is more uh, aligned properly where the light is coming down from the top instead of from the side. Secondly, the lighting is a lot more detailed than it should be. Diffuse lighting is generally a lot more blurrier than this. So in order to blur out the image, what we can use is this lot texture LOD function. Uh, LOD stands for level of detail. And that allows us to pass in a level of detail value. Let's say we'll start with three and we'll, we'll run this. And this blurs out the image texture by quite a bit. Um, we can also go up a little bit higher, say five. And that blurs it out even more. And I find that a value of seven looks pretty good. So if I set it to seven, it looks like this. Uh, the final problem is that um, like how we did our color space conversion here, where we took the square root of the color because we want to work in linear color space, we need to convert uh, this sRGB color into linear color space. So in order, to, in order to do that, we just do the opposite of the square root function, which is just the power with two. So we take the power of two of the image. So now the image has been transformed back into uh, linear color space. Uh, so now we can switch between different cube maps and see how that looks. So that's Ufuzi Gallery, and this is St. Peter's Basilica. And it looks pretty cool. However, in some cases, you might not have access to these images, but you might want to have something, you might want to do some lighting that looks a little bit similar. So I'm going to share with you a uh, formula I found to create uh, fake image-based lighting. So this is a lighting formula that looks like image-based lighting, but it's actually just a fixed formula. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove uh, the image. And next, what we're going to do is I'm going to type out my function. So we take the sine of the normal value. We multiply this by 2.5. And then we map um, sine from negative 1 to 1 to 0 and 1. So we multiply by 0.5 and add 0.5. And then this is a vector. And we want to get a scalar. So we have to take the length of this. And this is going to range from. Uh, from zero to uh, the square root of three, because sometimes this, this value will take one for each, for each uh, coordinate. So we have to divide by the square root of three. So when I run this, what we get is a, a pretty interesting look of lighting, like a pretty complicated lighting setup, um, basically directly from this function. So this looks pretty cool. I tend to use this uh, pretty much as my default lighting model for all my shaders. Um, this is what I call the studio lighting fake IBL fake image-based lighting because the light is coming from sort of all different directions. However, we might want to do an outdoor-like lighting model where um, the light is more coming from the top than from the bottom. So what we could do to make the light more come from the top than at the bottom is to multiply it by some factor based on the Z coordinate of the normal vector, which is the up and down coordinate. So what we could do is we can multiply this by the smooth step of negative one and one of n dot Z. So that's basically mapping negative 1 and 1 to 0 and 1, just with a, more of a smooth curve. So when I run this, so now we have the lighting model where uh, the light is more coming from the top than at the bottom. However, it's quite a bit darker. So what we could do is just remove the POW function that we're doing to the, uh, to the color. So when we run this, it's quite a bit brighter. And it's a lot more comparable to our, um, to our forest scene where the light was coming from the top. Uh, so that's all I have. Those are all the cool uh, lighting models that I've discovered over the years. I hope this was useful to you, and I hope you have a good day. Bye.